Good evening and thank you for tuning in. My name is Eric Osgood, Emergency Management Director for the Town of Johnson. It was said at the onset of this pandemic that we would all know someone affected by the coronavirus. That ring has closed in on Lamoille County. Former Select Board member and State House Representative Bernie Juskowitz of Cambridge has died from coronavirus, our first for Lamoille. I have worked with Bernie on numerous occasions. He's a really good man. My prayers and thoughts go out to his family and friends. The loss of a local resident really brings it home. COVID-19 does not discriminate. No one is immune to the coronavirus and its potential life-threatening outcome. This now makes it more important than ever to follow the social distance Thing, guidelines, wearing masks, staying at home, and the other guidelines set out by the CDC, Vermont Health Department, and ordered by the governor. We all can and need to do our part during this national time of crisis. In addition to the state and federal guidelines, a reminder from Johnson Emergency Management, all public playgrounds, structures, and the skate park are closed as well as there is a ban on open fires in effect for the town of Johnson. We will get through this. However, we must stay safe and follow the guidelines as prescribed. I'm sure most of you are aware and may have saw the governor's news conference today. The stay at home, stay safe has been extended to May 15th. The health department is also recommending when you go into congregated places, such as a grocery store or a drug store, something like those things that you would need to do, that you wear a mask. For everyone's mental and physical well being, we encourage folks to get outside, enjoy the nicer weather, take a walk, go jogging, or riding your bike. Any recreational activity that can be done that will not put you within the social distancing guidelines. These activities can be done on any public green space, municipal owned properties, the rail trail, or even one of our back roads can be very inviting. Tonight, we are honored to have as a fe featured speaker, Joseph Wooden, the CEO and president of Copley Hospital. Joe will be sharing some of the preparation work done current status and their outlook at Copley. Following his remarks, Joe, as well as the Johnson Emergency Management team and other substance experts on this broadcast will be available for a Q&A time. We will end our broadcast with our recreational coordinator and some local talent entertainment. It now brings me great pleasure to introduce and to thank him for taking the time to be here Joseph Wooden from Copley Hospital. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you folks. There's so much in the news uh, every time I go to Vermont Digger or look at any online paper or even newspaper. It seems like all articles relate to the coronavirus. So I'm not going to go over every aspect about it, but I'm happy to answer questions. So at the end, we can talk about that. But uh, I just got off a phone call with our corona, uh, uh, COVID-19 response team uh, for um, Mooresville. So we actually started up many weeks ago, sort of three teams, a uh, coronavirus response team, CH for uh, Copley Hospital, CRT team, uh, MV for Mooresville, and a CRT team for Lamoille uh, Valley, which is a much larger group. Uh, and that's morphed a bit, that's got, uh, dozens of people in that. So today I was just uh, finishing up a phone call 4.30 to 5 with the folks from um, Home Health and Hospice, uh, The Manor, Tamarack, um, Cheslov, all the primary care doctors, as well as uh, the Home Mental Health Agency. Uh, so we meet uh, and have been conference calling three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, for the most part. And um, the hospital CR team, team meets twice a day. Uh, we try to keep those meetings to a half hour. So we have manically been trying to address this uh, following somewhat the incident command format that we learned many years ago post 9-11, which has been helpful. Um, 
and we're addressing a number of issues. So PPE, personal protective equipment, has been a big issue for us and for all the hospitals and for the entire country, looking at surgical masks, uh, ventilators, um, and other types of face shields. Uh, I think Vermont is in uh, relatively good shape. I think we're in good shape in Copley. We could always use more surgical masks. Uh, we are appreciating, and it's been wonderful to have folks actually sewing together masks for the non-surgical areas to sort of keep us all safe. And those masks are certainly advisable when you go out in the public, if you could wear those masks. Uh, we wear them um, throughout the hospital, again, if you're not in a surgical site, and it's really helpful for the staff. So it's not that they're not valuable. They're certainly not as valuable as perhaps an N95 mask but uh, those are really quite important. Uh, PPE prices have gone up dramatically. Uh, we used to pay between five and 10 cents a mask. Uh, one order that we recently got, we're paying a dollar a mask. So that's a tenfold increase in price. Um, but we, we seem to be in, in relatively good shape. We are in need of more surgical masks, um, but as everybody knows, those are made in China. There are some N95 masks made in America, but we're all trying to figure out through this whole process where our supplies come from, what is the supply acquisition process. And I think folks are trying to figure out how can we make more stuff uh, in America or different places so that we've got a diversity. Uh, anytime you buy all of your same equipment or materials from one place and uh, they experience a problem, um, we learn from that. So. Um, with the ventilators, we've got four ventilators at the hospital, which is um, good. Uh, we're in good shape. Um, at this point, we haven't had any um, COVID-19 patients, and we're not really interested in publishing that. We sort of think about patient confidentiality and the fact that we're in really good shape with regards to the physical location, the rooms, the PPE, the staff training. So I don't think that when we do get our first case, we're going to necessarily advertise that. Um, in addition to the ventilators, there's been a lot of knowledge, and um, the knowledge and information around COVID-19 is very dynamic. I had a physician tell me quite aptly that it's kind of like the Wikipedia process is occurring in this pandemic and, when, and with this disease. We're all sort of contributing as much as possible to the public, through the internet, trying to learn, uh, trying to perform uh, scientific research, but in a very expedited way. And so everybody's trying to learn about that. So uh, if there are people with significant respiratory distress and they appear to be positive for COVID-19, getting them on oxygen as soon as possible is really uh, the, the best thing to do. We actually did purchase some additional high flow oxygen devices. So we have three of those in addition to the four ventilators. Um, so I think, again, we're in pretty good shape. Staffing-wise, uh, folks are trained uh, in a variety of ways. Um, but interestingly, with the staffing on, on some other related issues, our volumes, uh, not only at Copley, but throughout the state and even throughout the country, um, there's been something interesting that's happened in America, and that is volumes in emergency departments and also uh, not allowing elective surgeries, volumes in ORs, uh, and even in some primary care practices throughout America, and we've seen that here, they've really dropped and in some cases plummeted. Um, talked to somebody the other day last weekend on a Friday night, they were at uh, UVM Medical Center on a Friday night and there were only two patients in the emergency department. And they've never, never seen that on a Friday night ever. Uh, I've talked to folks at Dartmouth and others. We've seen a, you know, maybe upwards to a 50% drop in volume in our emergency department. So it's interesting. We all kind of think about this, how there's been a sort of psychological response in the entire community and through, maybe throughout the world uh, because of a pandemic and issues of maybe fear and um, maybe some unfound issues where people are avoiding hospitals. Um, I think initially people said, hey, you wanna be careful and uh, don't go to the hospital um, if you're sick. Um, that's why many of us do curbside testing, uh, although the vast majority of those come back as negative. Um, but there's 
some fear of maybe just going to the hospital. So it's again, it's not Copley, it's uh, throughout America. The good news is all the estimates of this uh, tidal wave of volume hitting in April um, hasn't been as much of a concern because our capacity is greatly increased because our volumes are currently that low. So it's happening in New York City, it's happening in Vermont. Um, we've had some volume estimates in Vermont going back um, a couple of weeks ago. Everybody was fairly confident in their accuracy. There was sort of a best case scenario and a significant worst case scenario that was pretty catastrophic. And then there was sort of the middle of the road and that was where we expected Vermont to hit the expected scenario. We, are, we have not only beat our estimates, but we're actually lower, significantly lower than the best case scenarios uh, in all of these things. Uh, Commissioner Levine this morning in a conference call was mentioning we have about over, a little over 700 positive cases out of 7,000 that were tested. Um, and we're actually in relatively good shape, 24 to 26 deaths, a lot slower increase than they expected. Um, and again, it's sort of positive news. We're coming back in general with a 10 to 12% uh, positive um, COVID-19 response rate from those being tested. Um, he was mentioning that in New Jersey and New York, it's more like 35 to 40% are coming back positive. So I think we're cloistered, doing well, and uh, there is some comfort in that. Um, there is certainly discussions, again, just throughout Vermont, throughout the country, and even in Copley, our area of uh, the concern over nursing homes. So we've had the two cases in Vermont, uh, Birchwood and Burlington Health and Rehab, where um, if you get an outbreak in a nursing home, it can be really catastrophic, and it does uh, tend to waft its way through the residents and the staff. So uh, in today's conference call between 4.30 and 5, uh, with the folks at the manor, we talk about these things, how best to help each other, how best to make sure we have PPE uh, staffing and any other ways to assist. Uh, you might remember when this first broke in Seattle, uh, there was a nursing home in Seattle that really took a big hit in most all of the deaths in the country. I don't know, 16 out of the first 19 were actually from that nursing home. So um, staffing, uh, interestingly, we've got low volumes and yet the staff are anxiously preparing to continue to take care of folks. Um, so that's one piece. Uh, I mentioned the facility changes. We do have a separate location. Our ACNU, we actually have a number of um, beds um, that have been in an area that's uh, refurbished, that's uh, private, it's got an ante room. So if we do get COVID-19 positive cases, we actually have the facility uh, to well manage them that is cloistered, which is really important. Um, and the testing process, so we're, we're always talking about doing the PCR testing, which is at, actually testing for the virus. And, you know, it's kind of good news, bad news. We all wish there were more testing sites available, quicker return on testing. Um, at times, we've been discouraged with the turnaround time. I asked the commissioner about that today. The, the, they're, they're saying that the turnaround out of the Department of Health and through UVM is 24 hours to 48 hours at most. And yet sometimes we find that some of the results don't get back for 72 hours or more. So people, if they're needed to be tested because they are showing those symptoms, uh, it can be stressful to not get uh, the results back. But in the testing process, the, the concern and the sort of logic that we wrestle with is if, if you test positive, we know what that means. We know that um, you have to be monitored, watch yourself, check your fevers. Some people um, go through the experience um, without much concern, others need to be really careful and worst case scenario be hospitalized. So we know what positive means. We really don't know what negative means because if you come back with a negative uh, PCR test for COVID-19, within half an hour, you could touch a door handle or you could have an experience and all of a sudden you're positive again. So um, you could literally test every staff member every day and still you could get, um, you know, COVID-19 making its way into a group of people and getting passed on. So the future of that, just a side note that we're interested in, the future is to do antibody testing 
to see if you've had COVID-19, what ends up happening is you start to produce two types of antibodies. One of them is sort of short-lived. They're called IgM. They become detectable after about seven days once from the onset of the illness. And after that, you start producing IgG uh, antibodies. They remain in the blood and provide long-term immunity. So the country and the world is all looking to say, okay, we can test for COVID-19, but it's more important that we start to understand herd immunity. And um, do we start testing healthcare workers, police, EMTs, and others uh, to make sure that there is uh, sufficient immunity in those folks and in those populations? So we are actually doing some of that testing for our staff at Copley, which is very exciting. Uh, we got in touch, our pathologist, one of our pathologists enthusiastically has been looking into this for a few weeks. And so we're, I think we're the only hospital in the state at all doing this. We're doing this for our staff. It's very exciting. It's very cutting edge because it's not approved yet by the FDA or the CDC. However, um, you know, the government has been encouraging rapid research, rapid um, exploring these issues so that we can all learn going back to that Wikipedia discussion. So we are participating and uh, that's exciting. There's a, there's a number of manufacturers who are trying to get this approved through the FDA, uh, but it's still going to take a long period of time. Uh, Mass General is doing it. That's the only one in New England that we know of. They're doing it with Harvard. Um, and we're involved with uh, buying these test kits from a company in Georgia called Ray Biotech. So uh, we're learning from that. I would I would love to say to you that if this all looks promising and we could all move forward, that would offer it to the public, um, because everybody I've talked to, if if asked, would you want to be tested for uh, antibodies to see if you've been exposed or perhaps you're developing that immunity? Um, as a volunteer, pretty much everybody puts their hands up and says, "Yeah, I'd love to help and love to be part of that research." Um, one of the long-term thoughts are is that. Uh, if you do have uh, strong IgG antibodies in your blood, that we can actually, the thoughts are that uh, we could um, not not necessarily copy, but uh, in general, the world, America, could actually get blood donations like you would at the Red Cross, spin the blood, uh, get the serum out, and actually administer it to uh, on-stage early fragile patients with COVID-19, and that's expected to help them recover quickly and much more dramatically. So that's that's promising. Until we have a vaccine, these are the things that we're all trying to do to manage and uh, be healthy. So I could go on for another 20 minutes, but I would love to hear if there's any questions or comments from people. Okay, we'll open it up for anybody who's got any questions of Joe or of anybody, there's a lot of substance experts online. If you're on the phone, I think you have to hit star six to unmute. Eric, I'll ask a question. Where where can we donate blood in Royal County? I'm sorry, say, where can you donate blood? Yes. Well, I know uh, the Red Cross would sometimes come to the hospital, mainly doing staff and some others. I'm not sure the Red Cross sites at this point. Um, I know nobody's using uh, blood in a in a methodology, as I explained yet, to, to help with COVID-19. So I'm not really sure about the uh, Red Cross schedule. Maybe somebody online might know about it. I looked. It doesn't look like they're in Lemoyle County. Not until early next month. Uh, I know you can go up to Burlington across from UVM Medical Center, and that's one of their um, headquarters, main locations. And I think you can call and just go up there and donate pretty much any time. That's a good question, though. Yeah. Anyone else? This is uh, Greg Stefanski. Howdy, Joe. Howdy, Eric, and uh, all the good people of uh, Johnson. Um, uh, Joe, you uh, mentioned the, um, the uh, CRT team for Lamoille Valley, and uh, I'm, I'm working with Corey uh, Purple from Copley and uh, Heather Hobart from the Lamoille Restorative Center. And uh, the effort has been to try to coordinate uh, both our health and our human service providers to have a coordinated response across uh, the whole county um, and uh, focusing on areas like food. Uh, making sure that our food shelves uh, are well supported and that we've got some backup systems in place. Uh, shelter, uh, there's been a process of moving folks who are at the Lamoille Community House in Hyde Park uh, to hotel rooms. Uh, and that process will be happening actually this weekend. 
Um, also making sure that uh, folks are getting the right information and the right support uh, in terms of the medical needs. Uh, and also, uh, and this is an area, Eric, I appreciate your uh, uh, checking in with the community on uh, how everyone's doing in terms of mental health, um, especially in a time of uh, uh, decreased connections and, uh, and, and isolation. And so um, a, a, a great team of people uh, has, has come together. We're using the incident command system uh, structure uh, so that we can align with uh, first responders, uh, medical providers, and our towns. And uh, Nat Kinney uh, has agreed to be a, a point person uh, for the town of Johnson. And so there'll be more details coming out, but just want to know that uh, a great team of people have come together uh, to make sure that if we get some aftershocks, uh, once we get through uh, people actually dealing with the illness of the coronavirus uh, and have financial impacts or are affected in terms of their mental and behavioral health, that those systems are getting strengthened and, uh, and Nat will be uh, our point person for the town of Johnson. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. I think all of us would like to see everybody get back to work and resume a relatively normal lifestyle, which would contribute dramatically to our health. So when we talk about the health of the community and Lamoille County and all of us, uh, you know, everybody knows that uh, we could just go back to and start to pretend to and move towards getting back to work, being active. Uh, that's actually going to help us both physically as well as the mental health piece. Joe, may I ask a question? Um, if some if someone needs emergency services, you said that you know people aren't using the ER right now. But if we need to go there or bring a family member there, is there a new process for using the Copley ER? Uh, there's not a new process. There is for the ambulances that are dropping off patients. But no, there's the process of us now screening everybody that walks through the door making sure that we check their temperature, give them a mask. So that's true for all employees and any visitor, but there is no significantly different process if you need the emergency department. Um, we have found though, and this is true in Vermont and elsewhere, there are people who are afraid to go to the hospital and there've been circumstances where people literally are experiencing a heart attack and are afraid to go to the hospital. So. We're trying to get the word out as much as possible that if you need to see a primary care doctor, you should make that appointment. If you need to go to the hospital or certainly the ED, uh, don't be afraid. But there's that kind of stigma that um, has sort of been perpetrated a bit that you don't want to go to the hospital because you might catch the virus. I think there's probably a much lower probability of getting it at the hospital than there is perhaps at a local grocery store or elsewhere, but um, we are concerned that people aren't appropriately using the services. Thank you. Well, this is Valerie Valcor with the Department of Health, um, one of your local public health services. Thank you, Eric, for setting these up and Joe for being on the call. Um, I don't have much to add. I just, just was just noticing and I'm trying to see if I can find it on my little phone here, but there was just barely a few minutes ago, a health alert that went out. Um, and for those of you who like data, it's um, titled the overview of Vermont res uh, residents testing positive for the SARS COVID-2 uh, between March 21st and April 3rd. And a um, couple of interesting notes here are that the, um, the median age of people who are testing positive is age 55, um, majority of them being between the ages of 50 and 70 um, during those three weeks. And as was already stated, uh, Lamoille County, we have been um, spared some of the higher numbers. And if you look at our rates per 10,000, we are um, around three for 10,000, um, while Chittenden County is um, 13. Actually, we're six, six for 10,000 and Chittenden County is 13. So um, just goes to show with um, higher density of people that that's 
um, with the, the virus spreading. Um, and just to contribute to Greg's comment, um, there's a lot of work being done at the State Emergency Operations Center and the Health Operations Center, of which I've been active um, in the last uh, week, is around volunteer services. So certainly we're hoping that we don't have an increased surge of patients, but if we do, there's a lot of work being done now to to streamline and to coordinate efforts around um, non-medical volunteers and medical volunteers so that um, long-term care facilities, hospitals, surge sites, um, nonprofits that are needing volunteer services can um, make a coordinated effort for that. So um, we're hoping that that will be published soon. And uh, that's really all I have to add to this week's call. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Has anyone else got something? We uh, have had, oh, hello, this is Jessica Bickford. Um, just to let people know, um, we were Healthy Lamoille Valley. We were realizing that there was a lot of people making masks and looking to where to donate them, and then a lot of organizations looking for them. Um, so we, on the Healthy Lamoille Valley website, uh, so healthylamoillevalley.org slash masks, um, there's information. Um, we work with Corey Perfall at the hospital um, to kind of put out the best best information possible. Um, so there's guidance on how to make masks on that website, but there's also uh, donation locations. So if people are making them and they want to drop them off around the valley, and we'll make sure they get to uh, the essential organizations that are requesting them. There's a request form on that website. So I'll put it in the chat. So thank you. Thank you, Jessica. We have uh, at Copley, at Copley, we have really appreciated those masks, and uh, we wear them all the time. People take them home, launder them, but it has been excellent because uh, we haven't had masks. We're trying to again save uh, the surgical masks and the N95. So I want to extend that thanks and appreciation to the community. Um, it's been it's been lovely. Thank you. So Eric Mark Woodward here. Yes. Ahead, how's, the, how's the food shelf in Johnson holding up? You hear anything from them? Are they superly busy or any word from them? We have been in contact with them. Does anybody have the latest update? Hi. Yeah, I got an email from um, Lillian White, and she said that the demand has sort of leveled off, and they got some new volunteers. And a lot of people have been bringing donations, sending money, bringing donations to Sterling. So the drop box is at Sterling Market, and um, and they accept checks to PO Box 17 in Johnson. Thank you, Lisa. Okay. Um, if there isn't any other questions or concern, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa for some of her announcements with reference to recreation as as well as some entertainment. I would just also remind people to, to check in on your, uh, call your neighbors and friends and family that may be uh, uh, homebound and just check in on them, make sure they're all right. But stay safe and stay healthy. And at this point, and I also wanna, before we go off from this segment, uh, thank Joe again for joining us. And I'll turn it over to Lisa. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Thank you Joe. You're so, Johnson Recreation, we've been trying to come up with some community activities for you guys to do while at home. And if you go to johnsonrecreationvt.com, there's a new tab, Community Activities. And we've just announced the April Activity Challenge, complete with $250 of raffle prizes for gift cards to downtown businesses. So check out the website and download the um, activity sheet and get your family moving on some activities. We have the continued teddy bear hunt, the hearts for healthcare workers, the Johnson Works folks have been putting beautiful signs of hope around town. 
We have a virtual walking team that you can sign up for, and it's kind of fun. You log all the steps from these extra walks you're taking. And as a team, um, we build it towards a greater goal. Um, yeah, and so there's lots going on. And then each Friday after the emergency management team update, we have live music. So tonight we are pleased. It's going to be Chris Lyons has volunteered to play for us. And next week mm -hmm. we'll be having Rock and Ron, the Friendly Pirates. So we're going to keep it family friendly, upbeat. Um, you know, 15 ish minutes after the broadcast will be nice live entertainment for the whole family. So call the kids in if they're not at the screen right now. And Chris is going to play some music here in just a second. Thank you, Chris. All right. So I've actually never uh, done this kind of setup before. So it's actually. I feel more nervous than playing out for some reason. I'm not sure why. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I thought I'd keep it upbeat, like she said, you know. And, uh... This is a pretty fun one that always seems to do the trick as far as upbeat goes, so. <laughs> Oh, yeah. after it all was worth, thought he was a bitter man, spoke of wins with you, tap you in the future, all before you leave and all. Love is burn, sing it back, you never let it Wish that I knew what I know when I was younger. Wish that I knew what I know when I was younger. Can't get such a creature. It's the hard way. That stays back on earth and no testing in the field. It'll come on strong and it ain't too long. Oh, they make me feel afraid. Yeah, love is fine. Soon we'll find it just a moment. With that, I knew what I know. When I was younger, with that, I knew what I know. When I was younger, if you want her lips, get her cheek. If you want to where you are, if you want some more, she's fast to see. Okay, maybe. Does that come through okay? It's all right? Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe for another one, I thought, uh, well, kind of seems appropriate to do a John Prine song. I just feel like I kind of see a lot of John Prine posts. He just passed away, actually, not that long ago. So. He wrote all kinds of funny songs and uh, I'm trying to pick which one I thought I'd, would be good to play. But I think this is perfect. Yeah. 
I will try my family trip. Western Kentucky, in parents of born. Is a backwards old town, soft and pretty. So any town where memories are born. Daddy won't take me back to New York, down by the Green River near Paradise City. Saw me, my son, but you too dead and passed. It's your peak by this cold train, it's all the way. Sometimes it flow way on down the Green River. And in old prison, down by old Avery Hill. Here in the Israelite state, we shoot our fist. Empty pop bottles is all we can kill. Daddy won't take me back to New York and by the Green River near Paradise Lake. I'm my son, but you're too late to kiss me. You keep by this cold train, it's all the way. And I tell you, my ass float on down the green river. Did my soul run on up to the Rochester Dam? I'll be halfway there with paradise way. It's five miles away, wherever I am. Yeah, he wants to take me back to New York down by the Green River. Sorry, my son, but you too big. It's to keep out this cold train, it's hard and weak. It's to keep out this cold train, it's hard and weak. In honor of Lake John Prime. Woo! Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so I guess we're going to wrap it up for the night. Um, Lisa is always going to have entertainment for us each night. And uh, if you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask. And we'll see you next week. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, you guys. Have a good Thanks, night. That was Chris. awesome. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Chris. Thank, Thank you, you, Eric. What's that? Say Thanks, Chris. <laughs> hey, Cosimo. <laughs> hey, Greg. <laughs> How is everybody? <laughs> yeah. What's that? There's Lottie. I know. I see people that couldn't see before. <laughs> hey, Chris. <laughs> hey, how are you? Great. Hey, you are. Sweet. How it works. <laughs> Good to see you all. all. Right. Yeah, you too. Have a good night. You yeah. too. Good night. Bye. You too. <laughs> what is that?